Welcome to the February 24, 2009 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, together we have the privilege and the pleasure of looking together in the Word of God, the Bible, that most, most awesome book which was written by God so that we know that everything in the original languages in which it was penned came right from the mouth of God. And there is no other book in the world that is like that or approaches that or even uh, could stand in the shadow of it. The Bible is absolutely a unique and special book. It is the book, the law book, that God has given to the human race so that we might know how to live most profitably and happily with God. In fact, we learn how we are to conduct ourselves on planet Earth in order to make the most of it and, and take advantage of all the blessings that are possible here. And oh my, it has been a wonderful time. Uh, this earth has been going on for a little bit more than 13,000 years. But now we're right near the end. And uh, uh, that is a little scary. Not a little scary. It's a very scary thing. And yet it is a blessing that God is giving us the time when the end is, is so that we can make sure that we're uh, uh, thinking seriously about it and our on behalf of our family and our friends, uh, because uh, at the same time that he is giving us that information of uh, the very day and the very month and the very year of his of uh, the end of God's salvation plan on this earth, at the same time he is saving a great multitude. And that means that if I'm still not saved, I could still be crying out to God for mercy. One thing, however, we never go to God showing or thinking how good we are. Oh, Lord, you're really fortunate that you have me that I want to be saved. Forget it. We're all sinners. We all deserve the wrath of God. And so we come to the Lord like the publican of Luke 18. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I know I deserve the wrath of God. Well, these are some of the subjects, and can you think of anything more important than these kind of subjects that we face on this program? And so, shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. And I, I hope all the children of Jehovah start praying for each other really Seriously, um, I'm sorry. What is your question? Let's see here. Um, Daniel 12, chapter 7. Daniel 12, verse 7. Let's look at that. Daniel 12, verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half, that when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, what is your question? I was just wondering if you ever concentrated on that times, times and a half. Well, that identifies with the 42 months of the New Testament uh, book of uh, Revelation, where it talks about the, the um, uh, or, or, or actually it's the 1200, it's, well, it, there are two time times and a half a time. First of all, there are the 1260 days that encompass the whole cell time of uh, uh, sending out the gospel, and then there is the time, times than a half a time, the 42 months that uh, are identified with the Great Tribulation period. And uh, both of these are really in view here in Daniel 12 because uh, Daniel 
uh, in the book of Daniel, we get just little insights uh, as to what is going to happen right at the end. Yes, um, for some reason I just... Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take, uh, inc incidentally, time, times, and a half a time, that's three and a half times. Three and a half times is like three and a half years, which is 42 months, which is like 1,260 days. Uh, that they all tie, uh, they all are, uh, you, it's a number that God is using, but in, in, uh, in uh, two different ways. In one case, or he's talking about the whole period of sending out the gospel, and the other he has, uh, throughout the church age, and in the other he is talking about the time right uh, uh, during the, uh, the, the period that is called the Great Tribulation. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Psalm 84, verse 10. Psalm 84, verse 10. Psalm 84, verse 10. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, what is your question? Can you explain that? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, in, you know, the, the thing that mankind wants is to have all the glamour, the glory, the adulation, the uh, riches that this world can uh, provide. And uh, uh, that's what's really in mind in dwelling in the tents of wickedness because this world fundamentally is a wicked world altogether. Now, to be a day in the... Yeah, or I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Actually, when we become saved, we are uh, uh, we are a doorkeeper. That is, we are keeping. We're at the gate uh, that leads into the kingdom of God, and there we are presenting the gospel to the world. We are ambassadors of Christ, encouraging people to listen to the Bible uh, and uh, be, uh, to making them aware of, of uh, how they are to relate to God and, and what's going to happen to this world and so on. As a true believer, every one of us is a doorkeeper. And uh, then, of course, in verse 10, uh, at the beginning, for a day and night course is better than a thousand where... Well, he's described it. I'd rather, if I only had one day, one day with Christ uh, and for, uh, as a true child of God, that would be way better than everything else that this world can provide. Of course, it's, it's, uh, it's not, never going to be that way because when we are in the <coughs> door, uh, when we're in the courts of God, we're there eternally. And thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Mr. Campy. How are you? Uh, very well, thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, I have a question. I have a couple of uh, chapters, uh, chapter and verses that I'd like you to read. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. There we read, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And um, could you uh, turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 19, please? Luke chapter 1, verse 19. There we read... 
And the angel answering him said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Now, what's the problem? This verse is badly translated. How do we know? First of all, it has the phrase, I am. And that's a very unique phrase in the Greek language that only applies to God. This is a verse that proves that the Gabriel is not an angel. The word here should be messenger. Christ is the chief messenger. And Gabriel simply is saying, man of God. I am, I am the man of God that stand in the presence of God and I'm ready to speak unto thee. It is Christ himself who is in view here. Now in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, there the angels, God is speaking about angels certainly. Later on in, uh, in verse uh, uh, 14 of Hebrews 1, he says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? But notice in verse 5 it says, They are not begotten of God. They are not sons of God. Angels are a different creation altogether. Mankind is created in the image of God. We are begotten of God, but not, not, the, uh, not the angels. They are created spirits uh, that are not identified in any direct sense with God, except that God is also a spirit, but but uh, he he's God and the angels are not related. Um, my question is, um, in verse 19 of Luke 1, where you refer to I am, I know in Exodus when God refers to himself as I am, that's in all capital letters, whereas here this is not. My question is, if Gabriel is an, an angelic being who is a messenger of God and is well, ex- sent up, is, can I just complete my sentence? In the sense of God, is not Gabriel emissary or or, or uh, a herald of the Lord who speaks on the Lord's behalf, which is the reason why he's able to use the term "I am" in this phrase because it's not an all cap. He's not saying that he he is Christ or he is God. Well, first but, of all, yeah. first of all. Any time you see letters capitalized in the Bible, they were not capitalized in the original language. There's no, or they were all capitalized. Actually, is the other way around. The Hebrew language, every letter is capitalized, and and uh, the translators tried to make a difference by capitalizing "I am that I am," but uh, the the uh, case of the Letters that make up I am that I am was was a capital, but so were the rest of the letters in that verse and the verse before and the verse after. So that doesn't mean a thing at all. Uh, secondly, the term I am is a very unique term. It is only found in a certain number of places, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it relates always only to God. I think in one place it relates to somebody who is uh, used of God as a picture of God. I don't remember that for sure, but I believe that that was what I learned at one point. But I uh, and you know we don't find any angel. Angels are named. Uh, they uh, Michael, for example, that is Christ. Uh, who is who is like God? Uh, that is Christ. He is the chief messenger. Uh, he is called uh, the uh, archangel, but that is an incorrect translation. It should be chief messenger. Gabriel is, means man of God, and uh, and uh, uh, he also is Christ. It, it, there's no possibility that he is an angel. Now, just because he is bringing a message, well, Christ is the messenger of the covenant, we read in Malachi. And uh, so 
uh, we can't take that away from Christ, that he can bring messages just as readily as any angel can bring messengers. messages. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Mr. Camping. I hope you're well this evening. I have a question, sir. Um, chapter uh, J- Jeremiah, uh, chapter 32, 37 to 42, which speaks of an everlasting covenant for Israel when they're redeemed, sort of ties in with Romans chapter 11, which speaks of the same uh, occurrence and it explains why it is ha- why it would happen. Sir, I, my question is, how does this fit into the timetable that the Bible gives us? Well, the Hebrews 32, uh, excuse me, Jeremiah 32, let's look at that. There it speaks about, in verse 37, Thus saith Jehovah, If heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I also will cast off all... Oh, wait a minute. I went down to verse 37. Let me start with verse 32. Uh, Now, according uh, in verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith Jehovah. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Jehovah, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them until the greatest unto the greatest of them, saith Jehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now that is quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter eleven, or or maybe Hebrews chapter eight, I think it is. Let me look. Hebrews chapter 8, where we read in Hebrews chapter 8, in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Jehovah. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, for from the least to the greatest. Now, this is speaking about the last 6,100 days of the period that the Bible calls the Great Tribulation, a 23-year period, uh, uh, exactly 8,400 days long, uh, that uh, ends the uh, the uh, timetable of the salvation program on this earth because on the uh, right at the end of that 6100 days which is the last part of that 8400 great tribulation time there will be the catching up the rapture all the true believers who have ever ever been saved are caught up to be with Christ in heaven and will never be back here on this earth again and there will be no more salvation Now, during that period, God will have a very special way, and we're in that period right now, incidentally. He has a very special way in building his kingdom. For 1,880 years during the Old Testament, he worked through the nation of Israel, having them serve as stewards or custodians of the Bible, and uh, because through them he brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, following that, for the next 1955 years, ending in the year 1988, which also was the year that began the 23-year Great Tribulation time, uh, he worked through the local congregations. They were given the task 
of getting the gospel out into the world, of caring for the Bible. But then, after a period of 2,300 days, the first part of the Great Tribulation, when virtually nobody was being saved, then God instituted what we're reading here, uh, both in Jeremiah 32 as well as in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, where God is working directly uh, between each individual and himself. There is no divine organization like a church or like a physical nation that is in charge of the Bible. It is, it is each individual as they hear the Word of God. That's why today on Family Radio we keep talking, read the Bible, read the Bible, listen to the Bible, and pray God for salvation. Don't trust anybody. You just wait upon God to do the saving. If it's His good plan to save you in His time, He will do so. And He's a very merciful God. And keep pleading for His mercy. And if there's a possibility that you too might become saved, because that is what is promised here, as well as a whole lot of new information that we have been uh, uh, teaching on this program, as well as on other programming of Family Radio that has that we've learned from the Bible and that has become revealed to mankind in these last days. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome, to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Yes. yes. I'm calling from New York City to announce the death of my dear Aunt Anne. She just died a couple of days ago. At the age of 92, she celebrated her maybe second birthday on Valentine's Day, just a few days back, and every evening she would listen to the open forum. She loved to listen to her friend Harold Camping, and just a few hours ago she was buried in the Calvary Cemetery here in New York City. I just wanted to say thank you for all the graces that you afforded her and to me and to all the listeners. Well, we're grateful that you maybe the open forum has been a blessing. To pray for my beloved aunt. Her name was Anne, and I thank you again. God bless you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Hello. Brother Kemping? Yes. Yes, i got a small question for you. Oh, well, first of all, would you turn your radio off? That will help. I just did. Yes. Do you think the way all animals and creatures act, do you think they dream about what's going to happen tomorrow? I have no idea. I have no idea. They claim that that a, a uh, some animals can detect that an earthquake is about to happen, but I don't know anything about that. They're animals, and they relate to this earth, but uh, uh, they certainly don't have any have any spiritual recognition of any kind. Uh, they certainly would not know anything about the end of the world or whatever. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good, uh, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Yeah, Brother Camping, quick question, quick. Um, I happen to go to the store and try to get a, a James, King James Version Bible. One one said Nelson, and the other one said the Zion Bible. Does that mean anything, or just get it? Or? I, I don't know what a Zion Nelson is. Simply the publisher, and uh, uh, the King James Bible is published by uh, quite a number of uh, uh, publishers. It can be Zondervan, or it can be uh, Nelson, or it can be there are uh, quite a number. And the uh, the important thing is not who is the publisher, but 
are they publishing the King James Bible and not uh, the New King James or the uh, uh, New Inter International Version or whatever? Because those also are being published by these same publishers. You just want to make sure you get the King James Bible. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Yes. Welcome to Open Forum. I appreciate you for taking my call. I have a question. Um, I've heard you on the radio proclaiming that Jesus is going to return in 2011. And my question, do you think that you proclaiming that, is that inspired by the Holy Spirit and God, or is that inspired by Satan? What what I, I'm sorry, what in what are you saying is an inspired proclamation? Right, right. The proclamation that that Jesus that you're claiming that Jesus is coming back in two thousand and eleven. I'd like to ask you the question, do you believe it's inspired by the Holy Spirit and God, or do you believe it's inspired by the opposite which would be let, let, let me ask the question. When the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, is that inspired by the Holy Spirit, or is that inspired by something else? Of course it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, because the Bible is written by, by the Holy Spirit, by God Himself. When the Bible gives us uh, the uh, proofs uh, and all the information concerning the timing of the end, is that inspired by the Holy Spirit? Of course it is, because it comes right out of the Bible. Any truths that we learn from the Bible, if indeed we have learned it accurately and correctly, that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, by eternal God himself. And in this case, it is because of God's love, because God uh, uh, wants to give everybody an opportunity, a one last opportunity, to make sure that uh, they uh, uh, are ready to face the end. What a what a blessing that is! But thank you for calling and sharing. We're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Thank God. Um, sir, Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11. Uh, verse 31. Verse 31, we read, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Please? Well, now... <laughs> The, uh, you're wondering what is this verse saying well first of all how are the wicked and the sinner recompensed they receive the penalty of death and all that goes with God's judgment punishment upon them because of their sins the wages of sin is death the soul that sins it shall die and so that is the payment that they receive. On the other hand, the righteous, uh, the word recompense they, uh, is a word that uh, we wonder how that identifies with the righteous. It is the free gift of God's grace that we are given not because of our merit, not because we earned it, not because we were better than somebody else, but because of the gift of God's love, we receive the inheritance of the new heaven and the new earth. We receive the inheritance of eternal life, living forevermore with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a recompense that is. It's, it's just magnificent beyond anything we could ever imagine. Um, the same verse appears in 1 Peter 4.18. Well, let's look at that. 1 Peter, and that's not unusual. You know that 
there's something in the Old Testament that's repeated in the New Testament or, or repeated elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, and the righteous shall, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? No, that's saying something altogether different. That's saying something altogether different. The righteous are scarcely, that is, we don't deserve salvation at all because by nature we're sinners. And it's only the mercy of God that we are saved. Whereas the wicked who are, who are, uh, uh, have not been chosen to become saved, uh, they, of course, still enjoy uh, living on planet Earth and, and having a lot of blessings in connection with that, but they, they do not receive eternal life. Uh, they, uh, that it does not come to them because that requires the action of God making payment for their sins. But that's a, this is a really not a, a, a parallel verse. It's really it's, it's parallel only in the sense that it's, it's totally in, involved with the gospel, but not not directly. Okay. But, One more question, sir. Yes. Um, during Moses' time, if a man was circumcised and that represented salvation, correct? When they were circumcised, that was an outward sign that even as the, reaper, the skin of the reproductive organ was cut off, so our sins have to be cut off. That action itself had no spiritual value of any kind. It didn't assist anybody in becoming saved. It did not guarantee their salvation. It was simply a sign that would cause them to think, Now, now I went through this bloody action of becoming circumcised, and uh, now my likewise somehow my sins have to be cut off and when i go when i study the bible i find yes it was a bl bloody action because christ had uh, to die for me in order to accomplish that to camping and how was a woman's salvation represented in the bible because circumcision like i say is only a sign it is not a substantive in any way in getting anyone saved. The woman uh, no, uh, reads about circumcision. She uh, sees that sign happening. It's, a little, uh, it's uh, when a man gets circumcised and, and, and it is known that he's been circumcised. Well, that's a sign to the whole congregation or to the, in the Old Testament, of course. That was an Old Testament ceremonial law. It was a sign to the whole nation. That's what has to happen to become saved. You have to have your sins cut off. And a woman's sins are no different than a man's sins. Her sins have to be cut off in order to, to become saved. But that Very act of circumcision camping. has no sub spiritual substance of any kind any more than water baptism has any substance of spiritual substance of any kind. Okay, thank you. Good thank, night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Barry Camping. Yes. I have a question. I have uh, two questions to you. Uh, regarding uh, my wife, she's working uh, in the Sabbath. Uh, she's nurse. And, of course, uh, she always duty sometimes uh, in, in, in a month. Twice uh, she's working uh, in the in the hospital. Is this uh, bad or good? We cannot avoid that. That is the schedule. What she's well, working Excuse for. me. We know that there are certain uh, uh, merciful work of mercy that must be done. Uh, doctors uh, uh, have to be available on Sunday. Uh, nurses have to be available to nurse. Uh, but, uh, of course, you have to be careful that you're not taking advantage of that. You know, in certain situations, if you work on Sunday, if you're a nurse and you're called to work on Sunday, it's double pay. 
Now, if that is the reason you're doing it, to get double pay, well, then it's all wrong because then you, it's just a job. But if it's a job that uh, there, there's nursing to do and, and uh, you have to take your turn on, uh, working on Sunday, uh, there's nothing in the Bible that I'm aware of that objects to that. But thank you for calling and sharing. Uh, I have but one more uh, question regarding the picture of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have, I have one picture that uh, she's, ri- he's riding indoors with the, uh, believers. Is this uh, good or bad? Yeah. Well, you know, this, the idea is that mankind want to worship a God that is somebody that they can take the size of you know that's why they make uh, in heathen worship they make an idol they make an idol of a of a man or of an animal or whatever and then bow down and worship because they can take the size of that they can see their god and so mankind also wants to see god well they can't uh, god is spirit but didn't Jesus take on a human nature? Well, we'll make a picture of the Lord Jesus, and and then we can look at him and be looking at our God. Now, that is a direct violation of the command of the Ten Commandments. You're not to make any image of God at all. And, uh, and uh, uh, it is a dreadful thing that this that this is happening because it is uh, it is a it is definitely a rebellion against God. We're in, how can you make a picture or an image of Almighty God who is infinite in every aspect of His being? It's impossible, and uh, and that's why God says, "Don't do it." But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Mr. Campin? Yes. Uh, my question is this. Uh, when, the, when the flood came, right, all those people were there, the, the civil station was at that time. It was probably maybe a, a million, two million probably around there. And uh, God destroyed them. Now, they, uh, now the, when the, the other who got saved in New York that's for the next next generation that they came along well I I don't quite understand your question in other words when, when, when God destroyed those people in that time of the flood right yeah the, who was left in New York well, eight people right well here it's very simple here we have four families that survived the flood Noah and his wife uh, Shem and his wife, Ham and his wife, and Japheth and his wife. They were the three sons of of Noah. And uh, they came out of the ark, and uh, there now we have four families ready to procreate and continue to uh, and bear children. And uh, then uh, again, uh, their children would bear children, and then grandchildren, and then great-grandchildren. And again, soon the world would become populated again. So in other words, the people who died in the flood, that was that was uh, that was a uh, generation that that, that died. And now this, this new one came along. Uh, the, uh, the people in New York, right? Well, the, the the Bible doesn't speak about them as a former generation that I know about, but they are simply. All the people of the world that lived at the time of the flood, they were all destroyed except for these four couples in the ark. And those four couples survived the flood, the only ones, and they, the world began again with them as it had begun originally 6,023 years earlier with Adam and Eve. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold? Yes. Oh, good evening. Uh, I had two questions for you. Number one, my mom keeps asking me um, about the, um, the 
the, the age of the earth. And so does this, is the, is the thousand years is a day and a thousand uh, days a thousand years, is that applicable to the creation? No, that is not relating to creation. That is relating to a very specific item the, that, a, that uh, is spoken of in connection with the flood of Noah's day as it relates to the destruction of this world by fire in our day. A day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, and that has only that single application. Okay. Uh, that is that Noah w was told by God, you have seven days to get into the ark, because on the seventh day the flood waters are going to come and and be pouring down for 40 days and nights so that everything is destroyed. And now if we... And that ark, it was really a picture of... Well, it was the only place of safety and the, our only place of safety from the wrath of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that if we apply that principle... A day is a thousand years. Effectively, when God told Noah, you have seven days to get into the ark, it was like he was saying at the same moment, you have 7,000 years, a day is a thousand years, 7,000 years to get into Christ. Uh, be, uh, that is, become saved, because then I'm going to destroy the world with fire. And lo and behold, uh, the flood occurred in the year 4990. We know that absolutely certainly from the biblical information. And the end of the world is 2011. We know that very definitely from all the uh, biblical information. And those two dates are exactly 7,000 years apart. The only time we can apply that... Um a revelation of the thousand days as a, de as a year and a year is a thousand days. That's the only time we can apply that application to the, to the reference of a day? And only because it's in the context. You see, God is saying, let's look at Second Peter chapter 3. Now, uh, we read there, uh, it begins... Um, verse 3, knowing this first. This is... Second Peter chapter 3, verse 2 through verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now that's talking about the flood of Noah's day. Then going on, whereby the world, but the, excuse me, Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In other words, even as God destroyed the world sometime in the past by water, now God is talking about destroying the whole world by fire. And then God says, Now, beloved, and that is a statement that is saying every true believer, they are the ones who are truly beloved of God. I don't want you to be ignorant of one thing. And that's language indicating, Wow, this is super important. What could that be? And he says, A day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Well, uh, what does that tie into? So we study everything about the coming of Christ the, the, on the last day, 
and we study everything that we can about the flood, and there, lo and behold, right there before our eyes in Genesis chapter 7, God talks about some days. Uh, we read in Genesis chapter 7, Genesis chapter 7, where God says in verse 1, And Jehovah said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Then he says in verse 4, For yet seven days. Oh, there it is. There's a day. For yet seven days. And I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from the face of the earth. In other words, come into the ark because in seven days, on that day, will begin a forty-day flood, a forty-day rain that is going to destroy everything. And then we go, we go on to read in verse 7, And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And in verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And then we read in, in verse 15, And they went into, or let me, uh, verse 13 first, In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three sons of, three wives of his sons with them into the ark, they and every beast of its kind and all the cattle, and so on. They all went in uh, that in order to escape the flood. And then in verse 16, they went in, the male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. In other words, God shut the door on the seventh day. Because remember it said, on the seventh day the flood waters would begin for 40 days. And so in verse 17, we read, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and, and it was lift up above the earth. All right, now, here God is teaching that Noah, who is a preacher of righteousness, is being told that in seven days the earth is going to be destroyed by water, and it would begin on the seventh day, and they had seven days to get into the ark. And then on that seventh day, the flood waters began. And, it because, and just ahead of that, God shut the door. Now, the ark represented safety. That's where anyone in the ark survived the flood. Anyone outside of the ark was absolutely, instantly destroyed by these flood waters that rose up 15 cubits above the highest mountain. Now, let's substitute a thousand years for a day. God is commanding, in 7,000 years, I'm going to destroy this world by fire. You have 7,000 years to get into safety. Now, where is the safety? In the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, and uh, and uh, lo and behold, when we uh, calculate from the Bible when these when the flood came, it was the year 4990 B.C. We've known that for for 35 years already. Uh, and uh, and when the end of the world will be 2011, we've known that for many years. And the and the time from 4990 to 2011 is exactly 7,000 years. Wow, what an awesome fact. And then even to solidify it so that it's beyond imp being wrong, God instructs us 
in, Jer in G Genesis chapter 7 that the seventh day when the flood waters began was the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar of that day. Now, many, many thousands of years later, God introduced a different biblical calendar that it is still the biblical calendar of our day, and when, but it's still the biblical calendar. And when we look at May 21, and, and, and uh, check that to find out what, where does that fit into the biblical calendar of our day, lo and behold, it's the 17th day of the second month. And that could only happen in the year 2011 and still be 7,000 years away from 4990. And so it locks it in. There's no way of, of it being any other date. And that, with those kind of proofs, we are ready to say, this is what God is teaching. This is not speculation. This is not a, a, a prediction of any kind. This is the fact that on the 17th day of the second month of the year 2011, which is to the May 21, according to our calendar, that the fires will come, that the end of the 7,000 years will be there, uh, that God is going to destroy this world by fire. You can't miss it. Incredibly accurate. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Oh, you have one more question. Go ahead. <coughs> Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. That was, yes, I called you and I got disconnected before I got to respond to your answer. I had answered, I had asked you a question whether or not your proclamation was from the Holy Spirit. The reason why I had asked that question was because in 1994 you predicted Jesus was going to come back then and wrote a book. And this is actually the second proclamation that you're making that he's coming. Excuse me, that was a prediction that it's possible, that uh, highly, highly possible, that 1994 could be the last day. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, Time Has an End, that was published only four or five years ago, and in which I indicated 2011 it would be the end of the world, but because at that time, I did not have any of the proofs, or very uh, not enough of the proofs that were made available later on through the Bible. And so in that book also I said, it is possible, highly possible, that the, that the end of the world would be 2011. That was a prediction. But when I wrote the book, 19, uh, that we're almost there, that was published a few months ago, I did not... Uh, 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 indicate that that was a possibility. That is, there, there's a, so many proofs that that lock it in that absolutely could not make any sense. For example, just what I'm illustrating here: the fact that in 4990 it was definitely on the 17th day of the second month. That's that's written in the Bible. In, Revel in Genesis 7. And, and now we're finding that May 21 is again the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar. Now, that could not happen by chance or by coincidence. It is just a, a proof that indeed we have understood the Bible correctly. And there are, are many other proofs. And so... The book 1994 was an entirely different kind of a book than we're almost there. Uh, that was a, the 1994 was a book of prediction. In fact, in the book 1994, I wrote, it is possible, too, that uh, 2011 might be the end of time because I, I clearly indicated it was not, uh, I was not indicating that uh, this is, 
uh, what I believe the Bible was absolutely teaching. But now that we have all these proofs, I don't dare. I, I, I would be, I would be a, a foolish teacher. I would be rebelling against God if I was saying today that I'm predicting that the end will be in 2011. Forget it. I'm not predicting that. The Bible is teaching us that, just like the Bible is teaching us that Christ is God. And, uh, it, and if the Bible teaches us, and we have done our homework in the Bible, so we're very certain we've understood the Bible accurately, then we have to teach it. We have no alternative. But we're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm calling from uh, Jacksonville, Florida. I just had a question. Um, um, I wanted to look at uh, Genesis chapter uh, 4. Genesis 4, yes. Verses uh, 16 through 17. We read, And Cain went out from the presence of Jehovah and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. And she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now your question is, where did he get his wife? Well, well, ba basically my my question was uh, how uh, it, it says he uh, he he uh, dwelt. He went out of the land and uh, he went into Nod, and basically he had. He had knew he had knew his wife, and and I, I would just want to know uh, how how could how could there have been like another if, if he had a wife, why uh, wouldn't the Bible had had prescribed or had indicated that 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 who, whoever this this woman was that uh that he had that that that, that that's that's uh who he was with or no excuse me. Uh, you have to read a little bit more. I uh, go on to Genesis chapter 5, and we read in verse 3, And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. Uh, Cain had killed Abel, and Cain was still living out there uh, uh, as a wanderer out in the wilderness somewhere. But uh, Adam and Eve bore a third son, Seth. Then it goes on to say, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. Now eventually, Seth would have married a sister, and so Cain also would have had to have married a sister. And then in time, my cousins married each other, and so on. It all had to start from Adam and Eve. But there's no mystery about this at all. Oh, oh okay, sir. Thank that, you that, for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Dr. Camping. It's, it's so nice Camping, to be able yes. to speak to you. Yes. Um... I'd like to like you to look at um, Mark uh, chapter 16, uh, verses 15, 16, and 17. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 17. And he said unto them, Go ye, this was Christ speaking to his apostles, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
Now, what is your question? Yes, sir. My question is, um, I received a book from a, a friend of mine by uh, Dr. Dr. by Kenneth Hagen, and she was telling me that she speaks in tongues. So I was sort of, you know, wanting to find out. Um, well, you see, the there are those who don't follow the rules in trying to understand the Bible. Now, the rule is that Christ spoke in parables. Now, what is a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Uh, the whole Bible is laid out as a series of earthly stories that have spiritual meaning. Uh, and the more we study the Bible, the more we see this. Now, here God gives us a beautiful illustration. He talks about these signs will follow those that believe. It says they will pick up serpents. Well, now, wait a minute. The serpent, that's a poisonous snake. You mean God is telling us that, that if we are a true believer, we can pick up a poisonous snake and it won't harm us? There are a few people who have tried that and they have have uh, been seriously ill from it or even have died. Or, and then it says, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. You mean, God is saying here, this is the word of God. This came out of the mouth of God, didn't it? That I could drink strychnine or cyanide or rat poison and it will not hurt me at all? Well, I'm certainly not going to try it. And, uh, and, Yet, if we are going to understand the Bible, uh, to be uh, just uh, uh, take it as it is, then that would be true. But on the other hand, if we follow God's rule, that these are parables. Now, for example, drinking any deadly thing. When we became saved, we drank the pure water of the gospel. Now, it wasn't literal water. It was the spiritual water of the gospel. If we would drink some kind of poisonous water, that is a gospel, if we are under the hearing of a gospel that has a long lot of wrong teaching, that would be poison. But it cannot hurt the true believer. Picking up serpents before we're saved. We, uh, we are ruled over by Satan. But... What he is the serpent, but once we're saved, we rule over him. We can we're like the snake handler. We can pick him up. In other words, the earthly story is that the serpent refers to Satan. Now the same thing when it talks about speaking in other tongues. It's not speaking about some kind of a heavenly language or whatever. It is speaking about speaking in the language of the true believer. We understand what salvation is. We use the same words as unsaved people use, but we have a different understanding. We have a different understanding of uh, how we are to relate to Christ and so on. It's uh, once, we're a, once we are saved, but it has nothing to do with tongues or anything of that nature. And so... Uh, these people, they take these verses and and use them for their own profit uh, to encourage people to think that they indeed are following the Bible. And they're not following the Bible at all. They're just ch making the Bible say what they want it to believe. But thank you for calling and sharing. <clears throat> And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you doing? Hello? Mr. Camping? Hello? Please go ahead with your call. Yeah, earlier this uh, this evening, uh, you mentioned to a woman that there are no names of angels in the Bible. Uh, you forgot Lucifer, known as Satan. Well, he's a fallen angel. Yes, that would be correct. Thank but you. But that's a name. Okay, that's the only one then. Right. And then uh, I have something about, are you familiar with the, uh, they give out a paper when you hand out the Does God Love You track, uh, when you receive tracks, uh, say suggested guidelines for 
Does God Love You track, track distribution. Are you familiar with that? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. Oh, when you receive tracks, you know, when you order tracks? Yes. Okay, with the tracks, they mail a little paper from Family Radio. It's a paper that states uh, suggested guidelines for the Does God Love You track Oh, together with the tracks? Yeah, it comes with the tracks. It's been coming like that for many years. Uh, they have two sides on it. On the other side, it's number one to uh, eight, number one to eight. And number three on that, is, it says this. Give to newcomers at church and Bible study with pastor's permission. Yes, that, of course, we shouldn't even be there. Yeah, well, You thanks. know, that's number three of that, that piece of paper that, that they give, you know, when you order the tracks. Then I have just one question. Okay, uh, did, Adam, did Adam inherit spiritual death? That's my question. Inherit spirit. Inherit. Spirit. You know, to inherit. Adam became spiritual, spiritually dead, and inherited that, but whether he ever became spiritually alive, the Bible does not tell us that. But okay. thank you for your suggestion on the tracks. I'll pass it along. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. Yes. Yes, um, Proverbs chapter 5, verses 7 through 15. Does that talk about coming out of the church and the end of the church age? Let me take a look. Proverbs, would you please turn your radio off? That will help. Uh, Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 7 we read hear me now therefore O ye children and depart not from the words of my mouth Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy ears unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and thou mourn as the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine heart to them that instructed me, and so on. Uh, actually, uh, no, it's not talking about fleeing the church, because for 1955 years, the rest of the Bible encourages us to be a part, become a part of a congregation, although we have to be sure we're wheat there and not tares. But... Uh, uh, it, this this uh, application about fleeing the church is only uh, applicable only during this last this last few years. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, my question is: uh, the woman called earlier about the last verses of Mark 16. And uh, uh, I read the King James Bible, and uh, a lot of the newer versions do not count those last verses of Mark to be uh, the Word of God. Where's your take on that? I know the King James translators translated that as the Word of God, but a lot of these newer uh, translators... I'm sorry, what verse are you talking about? Uh, the last verses of Mark 16, where it talks about picking the serpents up and... And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working yeah. uh, 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 and confirming the signs with, with the word with signs following Amen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like, it's, I think it's 9 through 16, uh, that in, in Mark 16, uh, it's, the, it's like the last nine verses or so that, or that mean, a lot of the newer translations put those, verses in parentheses. Because, because they don't understand how they 
uh, uh, apply to the gospel. They are redesigning the Bible to suit themselves. You can't do that. These are verses are in the Bible, but you have to... Uh, in the churches never knew what to do with those verses. They've looked at them and looked at them and looked at them, and, and uh, they knew you can't drink a deadly thing and not uh, be killed by it, and, uh, and yet they didn't know. And so some of the newer versions probably... I, I haven't read that myself because I don't read the newer versions, but I can see where they leave out very, very difficult words or verses. They, uh, th that certainly is true in other places in the Bible. Well, what but apparently we, I believe we that must happened, not do that. What, uh, what apparently happened was uh, uh, when they translated the uh, King James Bible, they, they had a, these certain Greek manuscripts. I thought they were called the Textus Receptus. And then later on, they had found other manuscripts that they believed were credible in, uh, in now uh, putting these verses into question, which I have a problem with. I, 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 think, I find it hard to believe that uh, for all those years that God had given the Word of God and we were able to translate the King James Bible, and now with these newer, uh, right. these newer Look, uh, manuscripts... Yeah, they're, number they're, one, number one, don't believe everything you are told. You know, they ha have to save face. They have to make a credible reason why they do what they do. But don't believe necessarily that what they are saying is truth. The very fact that they will change the Word of God by leaving out a passage that was there is already very suspect. And so just don't believe what... Like, for example, I remember when the NIV was first published... I read uh, some of the the uh, literature that was just ballyhooing how great it was that this was the based on the oldest Greek that could be found. That was not true at all, but yet it was made as a very plain boast in order to sell copy. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, uh, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Hey, you know, people have been calling in tonight and talking about Noah and the Ark, and so I'd just like you to consider a couple points, just two things. One, you know, in, in looking at the 4,990 B.C. date for the flood, you know, back then that was the Neolithic era. And people just had stone tools and stone axes, and it would have been impossible for Noah to build the ark in 4990 B.C. They just didn't have the technology. I think you're off by a couple thousand years. Oh, where, where did you read that? And then that the, they didn't the second, have the technology. Yeah, the, the second point is, is that uh, when you select that one passage and you say a year is like a thousand years, or day is like a thousand years. You just you just select that one passage selectively, but it, nowhere in the Bible does it say to interpret it that way. My interpretation of that is, if I have a teenage son and doesn't come home late at night, I go, oh my gosh, and I waited for him all night long, and every minute was like a hundred years. That's what I think God is saying. He says, I'll wait for you. I have patience. I'll wait for you for a thousand years. It doesn't refer to Noah's Ark at all. He's just saying, I'll be patient with you. Yeah, well, you, you, you have to follow the Bible. Now, let me get back to your first question. We read in Genesis chapter 4, and this was long before the flood, long before Noah lived. Remember, the earth had been in existence 6,023 years when the flood occurred. But much earlier than that, we read about... Uh, about um, uh, in Genesis chapter 4, uh, about uh, Zillah, verse 22, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nehemiah. And uh, uh, right above that, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. In other words, 
Now, you can't uh, trust the scientific community. They don't know anything about what was happening 5,000 years ago because the, the, the uh, 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 that is 5,000, yes, uh, that would be actually 7,000 years ago from now because the earliest writing was only 5,000 years ago. And so they, they don't know what was happening there. They're, they are speculating totally. But we have to let the Bible be the authority. The, really, the issue is, what are we going to trust? Are we going to trust the Bible as being the infallible Word of God that every word in the original languages of the Bible came from the mouth of God so that we have a solid authority that builds what we believe? Or are we going to just believe the Bible when it seems to be rational or sensible or agree with uh, what the secular writers write or whatever? And then you have nothing. You have nothing. Because once you get past 3000 B.C., there wasn't one word of that was written anywhere. And there were no hieroglyphs, no scratchings on rocks or anything else that purported to be uh, messages. That is maybe 3200 B.C. might be the earliest. Uh, there was nothing at all. And so anything earlier than that is pure speculation and has no value. And to pit that against the infinite worth of the Bible... It just doesn't make any sense. But shall we take... And when I see you, make, uh, will you make the claim that I am selective in looking at Second Peter 3, absolutely, because the Bible is selective. It is talking about the flood. And so let's stay with the flood. Where else? If, if there were another passage in the Bible that talked about the flood, I'd be looking at it also in connection where that a day is a thousand years. Uh, but it, it, it suffices perfectly when we read Genesis chapter 7. It's a perfect match. It couldn't be any better. Unless we don't want to believe it <laughs> because we just don't like the idea that uh, the earth is going to come in, in to an end in a couple of years and we're only kidding ourselves. We're only deceiving ourselves. God in His wonderful mercy and in His wonderful love is giving us that information so that we can properly react to it. And if we, if we uh, don't want to accept it and we uh, go into denial or to scoff, scoff at it or scorn it, it's for our own hurt. Because then, it, well, okay, you go ahead and do that. You'll just go into the day of judgment when that, time, when that date comes. But thank you, and oh, how horrible that will be. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Uh, John 9, verse 25. John 9, verse 25? Yes. All right, let's look at that. John 9... Verse 25, there we read, you know, the Pharisees are talking to this man that had become, that was blind from birth, and Christ had healed him, and they're really upset because that was a, a, a they couldn't deny it, that an enormous miracle was done, and so they're trying their best to discredit whoever did this, and they're coming at this young, this person, like uh, like he's the guilty one, mm -hmm. and uh, so they're asking. Uh, uh, they they in verse 24 they called the man that was blind and said unto him, "Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner." In other words, the every human being is a sinner, and therefore uh, obviously. The man who heals you is a sinner, and that immediately uh, would help to discredit him. And then the man who was blind 
says very, very interestingly, uh, whether he is a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Now, there you get the one thing. Oh, okay. well, well, that's what I was just pointing out. Um, the one thing I know. All right, what was, what was the important thing to this blind man? Who healed oh. him? Oh no, I was just, I was just um, I was just re referring to where he says one thing I know. Well, yeah, <laughs> we have several him. illustrations of that. It's like also you read in John 11, uh, or no, I don't know, it isn't there. I I I don't remember exactly where it is, but Jesus was having dinner with Mary and Martha, and Martha was all upset. Because Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, just, just uh, uh, being filled with all this spiritual truth that Jesus was speaking, and Martha was busy in the kitchen trying to make a nice meal. Finally, and she kept looking in the living room at Mary. There's Mary sitting, and finally she couldn't stand it anymore. She said uh, to Jesus, Don't you understand? Why isn't Mary helping me? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're so busy with much serving, but there's one, the, the, uh, uh, Mary has chosen the one thing that's important. The, the spiritual feeding is way more important than having a pleasant meal. But uh, thank you for sharing that. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, goodness gracious, Mr. Camping. Uh, how's uh, Bill Walters from Michigan calling? I yeah. <laughs> just been listening to your uh, your program tonight, and I had to comment on, on some of the comments that have been, been presented tonight, 1994 again. Uh, why don't they read the book? And they would funny it's so easy just to read the book and then comment on it. But uh, they're not going to see, Mr. Campman, because they don't want to see. Ninety-seven percent of the people are not going to see. It's that simple. I talk to people all the time. Some see. Very, very few. God bless your work. Well, thank uh, you for calling and sharing your thoughts. And shall we take our last call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. We have time for one more call, 1-800-322-5... No, we don't have time. <laughs> we're, we're right up against the end. Thank you for allowing me to come into your home for a little bit this evening, and may the Lord richly bless you as you continue to think about these serious things and check them out in the Bible. Oh, my, these are so important. Until our next open forum... May the Lord richly bless you.